thanks very much. Um, so um, I want to start by talking to you guys a little bit about um, why I got into this weird relationship with Nicholas Christakis. <laughs> It's not obvious. I'm a political scientist, and, and uh, Nicholas is a doctor and, and a sociologist. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what was going on 10 years ago. I was really interested in the answer to this question, why do we vote? It's a very normal question for political scientists to be interested in. And the reason why it's such an interesting question is because we have decades of research now that's really based on a model that doesn't work at all. Okay, so economists, when they try to answer this question of why people vote, they think of it as a cost-benefit decision. Okay, so you pay some cost, you have to tell yourself, you know, get, get informed about the campaign, you may have to put some gas in your car and drive to the, to the, the polling place, um, you have to take time out of your day. These are all small, but, but not zero costs of engaging in this act of political participation. Now, what's the benefit? Well, if you're an economist, you're thinking about what's the benefit to you? And you think about, well, the election, I want the election to come out the way I want it to come out. I want my favorite candidate to win. And so then you have to think to yourself, okay, I have two choices. I can either vote or not vote. At what point will that choice actually impact whether or not my favorite candidate wins? Okay, so let's think about the closest election, closest presidential election in U.S. history in 2000. You are one of the voters in Florida. If you stayed home rather than voting, would the outcome of the election been any different? No, it wouldn't have been any different. And what economists have pointed out is that the only time that your vote actually matters, the only time it actually would change the outcome of an election is if there's an exact tie. And the odds of an exact tie in the United States are estimated to be about one in 10 million. So you're buying a lottery ticket. You have a small cost, say it costs you a dollar, if you add up all that stuff that you're doing to go to the polls, right? You're paying a dollar for a one in 10 million chance of picking the president. That means that in order for this to be a rational choice, you have to think that it's worth $10 million to personally pick the president. Now, obviously, lots of people don't go through this calculation because they vote. And this has been called the voter paradox. And so I was really interested in this question. And I started looking around for alternative explanations, thinking, well, the economists haven't really sort of played through this, this question right. And I started looking into this older literature on social voting. Um, one of the things that we know is that voting is highly correlated between friends and family members. If your friends vote, it's very likely that you vote. If your family members vote, it's very likely that you vote. And I became very interested not just in these direct effects that have been studied, but in indirect effects. So in other words, if I vote, does that affect not only my friends, but my friends' friends, or my friends' friends' friends? And I went to my advisor and I got I, very excited about this idea that I'm, you know, I'm gonna do this, 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 this new project that's gonna be looking at how voting spreads through social networks. And he scratched his head and he looked at me sort of kind of funny. And he said, wait a minute, I've heard this exact same argument sometime in the last couple of weeks. And he told me about a talk he had just seen by Nicholas Christakis that was addressing another really important problem in social science, which is why do widows die? We've known for a very long time about the widower effect. It's this idea that whenever you pass away, your spouse then has a greater risk of mortality. And in fact, Nicholas has done some of the best work on this um, that suggests that in the United States, that when the man dies, the woman loses about two years of her life. And when the woman dies, the man loses about seven years of his life. I'll let you speculate on the reasons for the differences. <laughs> But he had this experience as a hospice care doctor of seeing firsthand the strength of these interpersonal effects. And he started wondering, well, what happens beyond the spousal couple? How are the spouse's friends affected? And the spouse's friends of friends? And even the spouse's friends of friends of friends? And he gave a talk on this. And, and my advisor said, there's someone you have to meet. And so he closed the triangle. Our story is a social network story. And we started working on these these uh, effects, these social effects that spread through social networks. Now, we immediately realized that what we we're going to need is we're going to need a source of data to be able to study these questions. How does voting spread in networks? And how do health effects spread in networks? Well, as it turns out, getting the data on health was a lot easier because we stumbled onto this really great data resource at the Framingham Heart Study. Um, and in that study, which has been going on since 1948, they not only had fantastic data every two years on 15,000 people over the course of 60 years of, of, of research, um, they also had been keeping social network records in order to contact people to keep them coming into the study. 
And as a consequence, we turned our attention to the health effects. And I had to kind of put the voting stuff away. And out of that research, we of course have our study on obesity that showed that if your friend's friend's friend is obese, it increases the likelihood that you're obese. On smoking behavior, on drinking behavior, on happiness, on loneliness, on depression. We then started looking at um, other kinds of data sources. So it turns out that there was another good data source for studying these questions in adolescence, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. And so we turned our attention to drug use and to sleep behavior. But still no voting. It made me a little bit sad that the original point of contact, we were both going to engage in, in this kind of research um, that I, I still hadn't found sort of the perfect place to, to be able to see whether or not voting can spread from person to person to person. Now, one of the things that, that um, I'm sure that you guys, most of you in this room are aware of is, is that whenever you see these clusters in these social networks that we observe in the world, that there's lots of different reasons why you might observe these clusters. Okay, so one thing is that it's just random. It's random that, that two people who vote, for example, might be located next to each other in this network. Or it's random that two people who are obese might, might be in this network together. It's also true that, that people might choose to be friends with one another because they're, they're both voters, or because they both go to the gym, or because they both like eating a certain way. This is homophily. This is one of my favorite words. It's a word that literally means love of like. And it's very hard to disentangle those effects um, from the other things that we really care about. And if that didn't make matters you know, bad enough, we also have this problem of contextual effects. And so if it's a case that you have an environment that's similar to the environment of the people that you make friends with in these social networks, that could also drive you to have correlated behavior, whether it's voting or whether it's health behavior or what have you. And so you have to figure out some way to, to separate out all these, these things from influence, which is what we really care about, because that's where you're really going to get these multiplier effects when you think about designing interventions to spread good health behavior, to spread product adoption, or any of the things that, that uh, you guys are interested in, in in the room here. And so we realized that what we needed to do is we needed to start thinking about another way of measuring these effects. So we turned to experiments, and we started doing these laboratory experiments and we realized that we were not only doing them, but they had already been done for us um, by other people. In this one particular uh, uh, study, we took some data that had been collected by Ernst Fair on a, a public goods game. And a public goods game is one in, in, in which I'm giving you a choice of whether or not to keep some money that I give you, or you can give it to the group. And if you give it to the group, you make everybody else in your group better off, but you're worse off. Now, you know, poking at economists again, economists are always stunned to find out that anybody ever give anything to other people. <laughs> but they do. Um, and one of the interesting things is that whenever you design these public goods games in certain ways, you can actually get people to be more generous or less generous, depending on what kinds of circumstance you put them in. Well, we took the data that they had collected, looking at something else completely different, and realized that we could get from that a network. Because the way they had designed the experiment, in order to keep people from playing with one another more than once, they had taken 24 people, and over six periods, they'd put them into groups of four, and, and it's like a big Sudoku, and eventually everyone can play with only one person once, and that forms a network, where you observe what people did in your group, and then you go to the next game, and you play with a new group of people. And so as a consequence, you're randomly assigned to these groups, you're randomly assigned to people who are more or less generous, we can see what happens when you're randomly assigned to someone who's more generous, does that make you more generous? And that's ex exactly what we found. If you play with someone who gives a dollar more, in the next round, you'll give 20 cents more. And the person who plays with you will give 8 cents more. And the person who plays with them will give 5 cents more. In fact, we were able to map out these, these generosity cascades to put a precise number on how much the network multiplies these effects. And what we found is that for every dollar of giving in the first round, the network tripled the total amount of giving. In other words, the network acts like a matching grant. And in this case, we were able to say this with more certainty than we were able to in, in the other studies that were observational. Because here, we were assigning people to be connected to one another. So this isn't about homophily. It's not about shared context. This is very likely a causal effect. This is very likely influence. Now, we, we started turning our attention also to the online world. The online world is, is, is very, very uh, powerful because now there's so much social activity online and everyone has their attention on it because there's a lot of data there, and there's a lot of potential for reaching people through their social networks. Um, but there are very 
kind of different in a way. Um, one of the things that, that makes this difference you know, very, very apparent is whenever you compare real world social networks to online social networks. And so just for example, this is 105 close uh, friends in a dorm. And this looks a lot like all the network figures that we got out of the Framingham Heart Study and so on. People here had on average four or five friends, right? And, and this, is, this is the kind of, of social life we live in every day where we're, we're, we're dealing with these very, very close, deep, meaningful relationships. Now let's see what this graph looks like when we add the Facebook friendships. It's a big ball of spaghetti. The average person today on Facebook has 150 friends. And for this population, it's actually well over 500 for, 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 for people who are in, in college now. And so when we started looking to see whether we could find the same kinds of things in these observational networks that we found in Framingham, we didn't find anything. We found nothing. We couldn't find anything that was correlated with anything else. And one of the things that we realized is that the reason why this isn't working is because there's so much dense interconnectivity, there's really no information about your 500th friend, um, what they're doing for, for you. Um, and so what we needed to do is we needed to be able to extract from all of this online data what these real world social ties were. And we started out doing this by using this. This is photo tagging. Okay, so this is actually a picture of, of me and, and my graduate students going to the movie The Social Network. It's, it's, it's very meta. Um, so, so, but we tagged this photo, right? And when you tag someone in a photo, it's an, it's an example that you shared an experience with them or that you were in the same place at the same time or that you care enough about them that you'll engage in this activity. I mean, when we started using that as a measure of friendship rather than just any old Facebook friendship, it dramatically reduced the average number of ties that people had. It reduced it from about 150 to about 10 on average. And we started getting graphs that looked like this, much more manageable. And we started looking at very, very important outcome measures. For example, whether or not you're smiling in your profile picture or not smiling in your profile picture. <laughs> So as it turns out, these clusters spread to two degrees of separation. So if I don't know anything about you, but I know that your photo friend's photo friend is frowning in their Facebook profile picture, then I can do better than chance of predicting whether or not you're frowning yourself. That obviously is a toy example. We also looked at uh, overweight. Because we have people's photos, we can estimate body mass index. And here what we found was these clusters that extend to two degrees of separation of overweight women and overweight men. And, and here you can imagine now, we have information about these clusters. There are 100 million people in the United States on Facebook today. There's this great potential to be able to reach these people and to map them the same way that we mapped those 5,000 people in, in Framingham. And so as a consequence of working through all of this um, health data, um, one of the things that I was able to do is give a talk at South by Southwest uh, a couple of years ago. And this is where the talk ended at the time. Um, and I said, wouldn't it be great if Facebook became really interested in pursuing some of these ideas with health or pursuing some of these ideas with, with getting people to vote. And at the same time, Cameron Marlowe, who's head of the data science team, he was giving a talk at South by Southwest saying, you know, we're starting to think about working with external researchers. Does anybody you know, want to do that? <laughs> um, and so there were a couple of people who saw both of our talks and introduced us, again, our social networks at work. Um, and we started talking to one another, and, and that was the birth of me finally, after you know, 10 years, being able to come back to that question that I was really interested in asking when I was a graduate student. So let me um, so tell you just a little bit about, about the, the current understanding of social networks and voting. Um, there's this great, fantastic work done by um, Lazarusfeld in the 1950s that, that was really starting to look at social networks. And then we kind of got diverted by the behavioral revolution. But it, it showed that voting, that the, the decision of whether or not to vote was highly correlated between friends and family. And this is, you know, again, based on an observational study. So we don't know why that's the case. We don't know if I influenced you to vote or if I chose you because you're the kind of person who engages in civic responsibility and so on. But there was, there was this great sort of, it looked like this great moment in the 1950s where we were going to start this research early and, and political scientists kind of took a, took a different turn. Um, recently, we've started doing a lot of randomized controlled trials in these get out the vote campaigns. Um, and as a consequence, there's been renewed interest in the idea that, that social pressure could be something that really explains why people vote. In fact, the largest uh, effect size that we've ever seen in a get out the vote uh, measure is, um, is one that's, that's uh, social in nature. So um, there's a, uh, uh, 
I, there was a some crazy consultant in Michigan who had this idea that what he was going to do is is he was going to tell people he's going to send them the typical mailer about the uh, election, saying you know now is is the time for you to go out and vote. And oh by the way, um, here's the list of people who voted in the last election, and we're going to send this around after the election's over with. So a tremendous amount of social pressure on people to vote. It caused voting to increase by eight percent. That's the largest effect ever seen in, in a large scale get out the, the vote study. And, and as a consequence now, I think that the campaigns are really interested in using the, this kind of, of technique. But a, a little bit after that, um, David Nickerson, he actually did a, a similar experiment where what he wanted to know is, is what happens if I just do a typical thing where I knock on a person's door and I say, you know, you should go and vote. And what I do is I only do this for two person households and I'll record the person who answered the door and I'll see whether or not they voted, but I'll also see whether or not the person who didn't answer the door voted. And what he was able to show is that this this person-to-person -person effect in in this this low salience election actually caused voting to increase by 10 percent, but it also caused the person who didn't answer the door to increase their likelihood of voting by 6 percent. So it doesn't sound like much, but what it's telling you is that 60 percent of the effect was transferred to another person in the network, and there's no information. Maybe it kept spreading outside the household to people's friends and friends of friends and so on. And so this has really gotten me interested in this question of whether or not voting can spread online. And so as a consequence, we um, conducted a massive randomized controlled trial on Facebook in 2010 as a result of this, this collaboration with, with, uh, with Cameron Marlowe. Now, um, let me just say at this point, um, please don't blog or tweet any of the rest of the talk because the, the research that I'm reporting is, is under embargo at um, a, a journal that cares about keeping um, things under wraps until they're published. Um, so, um, so I'm happy to share with you guys today, but I'd appreciate it if, if we just kept it amongst us. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this experiment. Um, it was very large. There were 61 million people who logged in on election day in 2010. How many of you think you might have logged in on election day in, in 2010? Raise your hand really high. Okay, so you were in our experiment. <laughs> so at the top of the news feed, we had a, a message that looked like this. Um, and I'll tell you about different components of, of the message. First of all, there's a vote measure. Okay, so today's election day. There's a button you could click on to say, I voted. Um, and so one of the things that we can do to measure whether or not people actually voted is to measure the people who clicked on this button. It also has pictures of your friends who clicked on, on this button. Okay, and, and these, these friends, up to six, it was just whoever had clicked on that day. Above six, people were randomly assigned uh, uh, the different pictures of the people who had voted that day. So say you had 10 friends who had voted that day, it would choose randomly six of those uh, friends to show you in, in this message. And it also told you how many of your friends had voted that day. There's also a counter in the upper hand, right hand corner of the number of total number of people on Facebook who voted that day. But as far as, as we can tell, that really didn't have much of an effect. So we sort of ignore that feature. There's also an intention to vote measure here because there's a, a, a link that says find your polling place in the US. If you clicked on that link, it took you to a place where you could type in your zip code, it told you where your, your polling place was. The interesting thing about this measure is it's, it's not very public, right? It's, it's just about you seeking out information that is likely very correlated with whether or not you, you intend to vote. And so this is another way we can measure the effect of this message. Um, now, if you clicked on the I voted button, you got a button on your wall. And so you actually got a message that appeared in your wall that says, you know, I voted today. Um, and that would potentially appear in the news feeds of, of some of your friends. Um, you may also have just told your friends about it in real life, but that's obviously something that, that we can't measure. Now, in any kind of experiment, you need not just a treatment, but you also need some controls. And so we also, with 600,000 of you, showed you this message instead. And this message was without the friends. Everything else was exactly the same, but you didn't see any information about the people that you were specifically connected to. And so we differentiate these two. The first one's a social message. This one's the informational message. Strictly speaking, it's, it's not quite that clean because there's still social information. The counter is still there. But you don't know anything about whether or not your, your friends voted, for example. And then another 600,000 people, we showed nothing. So this was the true control group. They got absolutely nothing. OK, so that's, that's the experiment. Um, it's probably the largest randomized controlled trial that's, that's ever been conducted. Now, I'm sure that some of you are thinking, now wait a minute, it's really easy to click on the I voted button and just say you voted when you didn't actually vote. And if you're a political scientist, you'll know that this is a problem. About 20% of the people who say they voted didn't actually vote. And the way we know this is that voting is a, an act in public records in the United States. 
Um, they're in public records because politicians want access to these lists of people that are likely voters so they can go and knock on their doors and, and get them to vote for them. Um, so researchers can use this information as well as it turns out. Um, and so we actually took a subsample of the 61 million people and, and matched them to these publicly available voter records. Now, we didn't do direct one-to-one -one matching because we didn't want Facebook to know who had voted and who was registered. They felt like that might be, uh, make things difficult for them in terms of um, the, the issues with pro uh, the scrutiny of their, their privacy policies. Um, and so we developed this, this procedure called Yahtzee, um, which is this group level matching procedure where we matched a group of randomly chosen people from the, the voter record to a group of randomly chosen people on Facebook um, through this hashing technique. And we just kept doing that over and over and over again um, so that individuals in each of those groups, we got a finer and finer and finer picture of whether or not they actually voted. And we can set exactly how precise it is whether or not we actually know what you did. But with still enough uncertainty that, that we wouldn't be able to go to the information and say for sure, aha, Nicholas, he didn't vote last time. He's a bad guy. So, so we developed this procedure. We matched about 6 million users in 13 states. This is about a third of the US population. Um, the match rate was about 33%. This is a little bit low compared to other Get Out the Vote um, campaigns where they do this matching to public voter records. Um, we suspect this has to do with the skew in the age distribution. So um, as you'll notice, the blue line is the age distribution of people on Facebook, and the green is the match rate. So you have a lot of younger people who are harder to match than in, in a typical study where, where you know, you're looking at a bunch of older people who are easy to match. Um, so we were pretty happy with this, so six million people where we know whether or not they actually showed up to the polls and, you know, showed their license and, and voted. Okay, so those are our measures of voting. Um, we did a nice randomization check. I love doing randomization checks on 61 million people because they often show you ex the exact numbers go out to like four digits. Um, um, so um, you can see here um, the age, you know, for the people who receive the social message was 34.71 compared to the people who received no message was 34.72. Um, and so it looks like the randomization worked, which isn't always true. You know, it's, Facebook is a, a big complex system and sometimes things go wrong, so you wanna make sure that the randomization worked. The fact that the randomization works means that we can be pretty certain, certain that there aren't gonna be any uh, effects that are driven by artifacts. Now, there still might be a false positive, but, but we're not gonna have any problems with homophily, we're not gonna have any problems with context in the analysis of the results. And so here are the, the top line results. And, and what I'm gonna show you is four different comparisons. The, the first three comparisons are comparing the social message to the informational message. Now you might ask me why I'm comparing those two. Don't we just wanna compare to the control? Well, the problem is if I'm using the measures that appeared in the message, the people who didn't get the message didn't have any way of clicking on the iVoto button or clicking on finding their polling place. So the only thing I can do is I can measure what impact social information has on those people. And what this shows you is that the people who received the social message were about 2% more likely to click on the I voted button compared to the people who only had the informational message. Um, they're also about 0.2% more likely to search for their polling place. Um, and then with the validated voting records, they're about 0.4% more likely to actually show up at the polls and vote. Um, now, You'll see the standard error bars there. The, for validated voting, we only have six million people, so you can actually see it. There are standard error bars on those first two, but they're so small because there's 61 million people um, that essentially, you know, the number is the number. You don't have to worry about whether or not it's different from zero because you know it's different from zero. So the idea here is that it looks like social, giving people social information actually had a bigger direct impact on those individuals. Now the fourth measure is actually social message versus control. And here what we found is that you were 0.4% more likely if you received the social message to turn out the polls than if you received nothing at all. And it's instructive that that's exactly the same size as the other measure that compared social message to the informational message. In fact, when you do the third comparison, information versus control, the effect size is zero. What this means is people were, were unaffected by the information, but they were affected by seeing the pictures of their friends. Okay, so this is very important. Social just like all these other studies that are coming out in political science now, it looks like these social interventions are the ones that are most effective in getting people to change their behavior. Now, so far, like, there's a lot here. There's a lot of stuff that's really cool, but I don't care about any of this. What I care about is this, measuring social contagion. So I don't want to just know what the direct effect of the messages and the people who received it. I want to be able to compare the friends of the people who are treated to the friends of the people in the control group. 
Because by doing that, I'm going to be able to do what David Nickerson did, but at a very, very massive scale. And that is to estimate how much of this direct effect is being spread, being passed on to the other people in their network. And so to answer this question, whether or not um, there's influence spreading in this network, we want to go back to this example I gave you of, of the earlier Facebook work we did, where you have to think about whether or not all the Facebook friends are important or whether it's just the close friends that are important. Um, and so we're going to categorize people into, into three different types. There's the, there's the um, friend, okay, so that's going to be any one of your Facebook friends, except for the people who are close friends. We need some measure to try to predict whether or not two people will have a real face-to-face -face relationship in, in real life. And then we're also going to be looking at the close friends of close friends to see if we get this person-to-person-to-person -person -person effect of the intervention. And in this case, to measure close friends, we started out actually using the photo friend technique, and that was pretty effective. Um, but we also thought that there's a lot of information on Facebook we can use besides the photos in order to, tr to try and des design um, this measure of close friends. And so we, we actually asked 2,000 people um, to fill out a survey where they answered this question. Think of the people you have spent time with in your life, your friends with whom you have a close relationship. Your friends might also include family members, neighbors, coworkers, classmates, advisors, and so on. Please list these friends. And we had them list them. And then we went through and we matched their friends to their Facebook IDs. And now we have all the Facebook information. And we can see which of that information actually works for predicting who has these close real world ties. And we developed a machine learning algorithm, which with 90% effectiveness can predict who your best friend on Facebook is. And the main way it does this is just by looking at the number of times you contact one another. Any kind of contact whatsoever. You like something they did. You comment on their status, you comment on a photo, any kind of touch whatsoever. You just total those, and that ends up being a really good predictor. And you can see whenever we sort people according to how often they contact one another from the first decile to the second decile to the third decile, so the people who do this, you know, if you ranked all your friends from the least to the most, um, the ones who are in that top 10% of your friends who you've had at least one contact with, um, they're the ones that are most likely to be your close friend in real life. So to give you an idea what one of these um, close friend networks looks like, this is Abilene, Texas, the network of, of close friends in Abilene, Texas. And each red dot here is someone who voted, and each white dot is someone who didn't vote. And if we didn't have an, an experiment to analyze, we could just stop here and we could look to see whether or not the, the behavior of voting tends to be correlated. And we would replicate what we already know from the studies um, of the 1950s, that yes, if your friends vote, you're more likely to vote. But we don't know why that's the case in this particular instance because this is just an observational result where we're looking to see who voted and we're looking at the network. Ideally, what we want to do is we want to measure what's happening as a result of the experiment. To give you an idea of the scale of the number of friends that we're going to be analyzing, um, in this particular uh, data set, we have 8.3 billion non-close friends that we can study, 767 million close friends, and 16 billion close friends of close friends. And these, uh, the distribution of the friends shows you that most people have a small number of, of each one of these types of friends, and there are a few people who have, have very large numbers of these friends. And what we're going to do is we're just going to compare what we observed in the network, where we take the correlation between whether or not your friend received the treatment and whether or not you voted, and we're going to compare that measure to the exact same measure that we'll get when we hold the network fixed and we just randomly assign who got the treatment and who didn't. This is the counterfactual world. We'll do this like a thousand times to generate a distribution of possible outcomes that could have been due to chance. If the observed outcome falls outside of that distribution, then what that suggests is that there is uh, actually a, an effect here. This is the same thing as doing a, per, uh, a regression or, or a permutation test in other contexts. And to show you what these results look like, what we've got now is we've got tie strength on the, on the x-axis here. And so this is going from your bottom 10% friends to your top 10% friends in terms of the number of times they've contacted you. So as you go to the right, the friend strength is getting, getting uh, closer. And we've got histograms to show you the null distribution of these randomly reassorted uh, treatments within the network. The black lines are 95% confidence intervals, and the blue dots are what we actually observed. And what this is showing you is that for even, even for the weakest tie, even for the weakest tie, if one of your friends got the treatment, then you were 0.025% more likely to vote. Now, that sounds really, really small, but you have a lot of friends. And, and as you get closer to this person, as the tie strength increases, you can see that the effect size increases so that every extra close friend who received the treatment actually increases the likelihood that you'll vote by about one-tenth of a percent. Now, this is expressed vote. This is what you do online. Let's see what happens um, to real voting. You notice that real voting actually 
if, if someone's just a Facebook friend, you're going to completely ignore them. In fact, the only time whenever we start to see an effect that's different from chance is for the top 20% friends. So for the 20% of your friends that are closest to one another on Facebook as predicted by, by this model, um, those are the ones where we start to get a significant effect. And if one of these close friends actually votes or actually rece receives a treatment, um, you are more likely to actually vote by about 0.2%. And we also did this for, um, for polling place search, for looking for your polling place. Um, and it's a little bit harder to detect because the, the effect size is smaller for the, uh, the direct effect. But you can see that we have a significant effect um, at two or three locations for amongst the, the closest friends. And so just to put all these numbers in perspective, what we did is, is we aggregated the per friend effect into a per user effect. Right? So if you have 100 friends and there's a per friend effect of 0.1%, that's going to end up being a total uh, per user effect of 10%. And so we aggregated all those together, and these, these were what we found. We found that with the expressed vote, that we get contagion amongst all three types of friends. Okay, so if your close friend um, uh, is treated, it makes you 0.9% more likely to vote if you add up all the close friends being treated. If all of your close friends, all of, all of your friends are treated, it increases uh, your likelihood of, of expressing your vote by about 1.4%. And if you're, if you're uh, friends of friends are treated, if all of them are treated, it increases the likelihood that you're, uh, you'll say that you voted by about 1.7%. Now those numbers seem small, but remember we've got a population of 61 million people here, and so you add those up, and that's millions of people who are clicking on this I voted button for no other reason than the fact that their friends received the treatment. Now in terms of validated vote, we're using this information that we, we actually got from publicly available voter records, um, we find that there's actually an even stronger effect. So if all of your close friends are treated, it increases the likelihood that you'll actually go out and vote by almost 2%. Um, and that's about 280,000 people that we estimate that Facebook actually got to vote that wouldn't have voted otherwise is a consequence of this effect spreading through the network. Not the direct effect, but the indirect effect. And, and we also looked at polling place search, and there are an extra 70,000 people that we estimate um, looked for their polling place as a consequence of this intervention. Now, the, 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 one of the take-home points here is, is look at that 280,000 number. Let's compare that to the size of the direct effect. Okay, so if you recall, there was only a 0.4% increased chance of you voting if you yourself received the treatment. But if all of your close friends received the treatment, there's actually an increased effect of about 1.8%. So in other words, what this means is that since most of the people on Facebook receive this treatment, we get about 60,000 of the people that change their behavior because of the direct effect, but 280,000 people that change their behavior because of the way it spread through the network from person to person to person. In other words, if you were measuring the impact of this intervention just by looking to see whether or not the people who received your message actually changed their behavior, you'd be missing over 80% of the effect. And this is where I think, think social networks, these online social networks, are, are going to be so powerful because we're going to start to learn how to use this not just for voting, but for a wide variety of different outcomes that we really care about. Hopefully, we'll be able to use this to fight the obesity epi epidemic, to be able to make people healthier in a, in a wide variety of ways. So let me wrap up with just some main points from the experiment. First of all, the social appears to be more important than the informational. In fact, there's no evidence that the information-only message actually affected real vo voting behavior at all. Um, and so, so the, the message here is that when you're doing things online, you want to show people pictures of their friends' faces. And in fact, we have another experiment that, that's an add-on to this that shows that the closer you are um, to, to the person that's in the picture, the more affected you are by the pictures that you saw. And so you want to get these real-world friends. You want to show people their real-world friends when you're trying to change their behavior. Um, another thing is, is that these close friends are actually more important than the online friends. You, know, you may have thousands of friends on Facebook, but the chances are very good that you're still only influential with a very small group of people, these five to ten people that you have real face-to-face -face relationships with when it comes to changing their behavior. The indirect effect is much bigger than the direct effect, and so it's really important to do these kinds of social network analyses in order to be able to measure the full effect of any kind of intervention that we're doing. And, and you know, a lot of the people still doesn't see the world in terms of networks, and they're doing all kinds of things every day, and they're missing the story. They're, they're missing most of what is going on in terms of, of them trying to make the world a better place. Um, and as a consequence of, of these interventions, I really think that, that these online social networks are going to be able to be harnessed to influence other important behaviors. Um, in future, we're going to be doing these experiments in other countries. We've got the Mexican elections coming up in, in July, and we're looking into uh, possibly doing another experiment there. 
We're going to be looking at interactions because now that we have this treatment effect for so many people, we can look to, to see who's more influential and who's more influenceable in the network just by interacting the treatment effect with different attributes of different individuals. Um, we're going to be looking at status messages to see how the treatment affected uh, language on the day. We already have some evidence that, that people talked more about politics, for example, if they, they got the, the treatment rather than getting the control. Um, we're looking at happiness as an outcome measure. It's, as it turns out, it's, it's not that hard to measure happiness. Michael Macy has a great paper in, in um, science recently on, on um, uh, happiness in Twitter messages. And we want to see how happiness spreads from person to person in the network. Um, the thing that we're doing now in order to try to control for some of these issues with observational studies is we're looking at the weather as, as a, a, a treatment effect. And so the question is, if your friend is in a city where it's raining, does that make you more miserable? Um, and so far, it looks like the evidence is yes, that's true. Um, but um, that, that study will be forthcoming. We're also looking at employment. So it turns out that there are, uh, looks like there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people on Facebook who got jobs from their friends. And so we're doing this massive version of Granovetter, um, Granovetter 2, I like to call it, where, where we're looking to see whether or not it's the close ties that you get your jobs from or it's the weak ties that you get your jobs from. And then finally, we're measuring ideology. We're able to, to see what kinds of candidates you liked and place candidates on a left-right spectrum. And one question is, is there a universal left-right uh, spectrum in human behavior? Is our left-right spectrum the same left-right spectrum as they have in England or in France or in South Africa? Um, and so, so I'm very excited. It's, it's very, very um, thrilling every day to, to go to work with these brilliant graduate students and this great data. And, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Did you want to do questions? Yeah. So the question is about whether or not the growing amount of information that people have now is changing the size of these effects. And going forward, you know, can we expect these effects to decline? You can imagine that, that um, people's attention is being grabbed. And especially if we find out that some of these things work as much as this experiment suggests, or as, as some of the, um, I know some of the work that Activate Networks is doing is showing very large effects for some of these targeting um, uh, efforts. Um, you know, more and more people are going to get the message, and they're going to be fighting for people's attention in these networks. And you have to imagine that at the margin, then, when more people start doing this, that it's going to be harder to get that bang for your buck. I don't know. It's an open question, and it's, it's early days for this. I, I would say we should just go as fast as we can now and get as big an effect size as we can now. And, um, and wait and see whether or not these, these effects remain. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is whether or not I can predict 2012 behavior from treatments in 2010. Because there's some evidence, especially among first time voters, that if you can just get an 18 year old into the polling booth, that they'll be a voter for life. Um, and so one of the things we're gonna be looking at is, is whether or not just that targeting that intervention at that perfect moment in time, not who, but when, is a way to get these effects to persist. Oh, in the back there, yep. So I just wondered if you have any information on um, contagion effects with less socially desirable behaviors than voting. Uh, so this is the first experiment we've done with Facebook. This is the only um, experimental evidence that we, we have right now. Um, one of the interesting questions is whether or not the treatment affected other kinds of, of behaviors. Do you, do you have one in mind? Like, are you, is there something in mind that you're? Smoking. Uh, smoking, yeah. So. That, that would be interesting because I would imagine a very differential reaction in the population. So some people will, will be highly approving of a smoking cessation campaign and others will be very derisive of it, right? So, um, so I don't know. I, that's an, another question of whether or not social desirability is just playing a role in this. We do know we were able to compare um, over-report and under-report in this. So not just using as an outcome variable whether or not you voted or whether or not you say you voted, but but looking at the people who said they voted but who they didn't actually vote, right? And one of the things that we found was, was that the treatment had an effect on both. It caused people to actually increase the likelihood that they voted, but it also increases the likelihood that people who didn't vote would say they voted, right? And that's the social desirability effect. And, and um, they're surprising to me, they were about the same size. I, if you had asked me before this, I would have said that the social desirability effect would have been much, much larger, but, but they, were, they were about the, about the same size in this particular case. So the question is, if you said vote for X in the right-hand column, would they have a nil effect? Um, you know, it's hard to extrapolate from experiments, but I would say, I would, my advice would be put pictures of photos 
um, for people. And uh, the closer the person is to you in real life, the more it's going to matter. This, this experiment suggests that that might not work, that, that that kind of advertising might not work, that what you really need to do is you need to make it social, personal in, in some way. Okay, thank you guys.